broadcasting live from Forward Observer Central Command in Austin, Texas. It's the man always out front on the issues. You're listening to Out Front with Mike Shelby. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Out Front. I'm your host, Mike Shelby. On today's show, we will be continuing our discussion about civil war, an insurgency, a popular revolution, a fill in the blank, whatever kind of domestic conflicts that's headed our way in this country. I don't make predictions because I, I understand that you really cannot predict the future. However, I have a high degree of confidence that we are going to have another surge in civil unrest, civil strife, at a minimum low-intensity conflict. Could it rise to the level of a quote-unquote civil war? Yeah, it could. Um, I'm, I'm not certain about a great deal of things. I am certain that is going to happen, uh, as, as certain as, as one can be about the future. One of the reasons, just just recapping from yesterday, one of the reasons why I dislike the term civil war is because it is rather vague. It carries a wide array of connotations. You say civil war. I say civil war to 10 different people, and I'm probably going to get, I don't know, at least three, four, five or more different answers. As I will cover, as I cover in my upcoming book, I don't have a published date. It's not done. I've still got a ton of research I'm trying to do for this thing, trying to fit it around my schedule over at Ford Observer. Uh, A civil war could be a wide array of types of conflicts. I mean, it could be a a civil war could describe a war of secession, like the American Civil War, a war over control for an entire country, like the Spanish Civil War, a religious sectarian conflict, such as the Iraqi Civil War, By the way, I was deployed to in in 2008, 2009. Ethnic and independence conflicts. So a lot of people refer to what happened in Yugoslavia as the Yugoslav Civil War. A state-sponsored dirty war, like Argentina's Civil War, and other domestic conflicts. There are varying definitions of what a civil war is, and I'm just going to share with you, by the way, if you disagree with me, that's fine. I'd like to read your disagreements in the comments. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I am sharing with you what I consider to be a civil war. And there are, let me just start off with, there are people who say, and I actually think this is wrong. There are people who say that a civil war is a war between citizens of the same country. And you could say under that definition, you could say that a gang war is a civil war. Citizens of the same country, you could say that uh, right wing and left wing militias uh, go to war against each other. I mean, I don't know. Let's just say, okay, that would be a civil war. I would not consider that a civil war. The definition that I use comes from Singer and Small. Yeah, by the way, people waiting on the other channel. I don't know why. Uh, I guess this was maybe scheduled for the other channel. I don't know why. Uh, at any rate, so I don't know, Ben, if we could tell him to come over here. I'm not sure. Uh, at any rate, there are four four pieces of the definition that I prefer to use for civil war and just recapping from yesterday. Number one, domestic military action. Okay. Not just police action. You can't deploy police to the streets and say, that's a civil war. There has to be military action involved, military deployment. Number two, government involvement as a belligerent. So this is not just a war between citizens. The government is on one side of this conflict and also the military. You have to have capable fighting on both sides of the conflict. So a genocide, for instance, would not be a civil war. And uh, again, I'm I'm kind of iffy on this. It seems somewhat arbitrary. A thousand combat-related deaths in a 12-month period. That was the definition used by Singer and Small. What they're getting at is sustained fighting. And I, I think there could be fewer than 1,000. Uh, and it maybe maybe it's still a civil war. At any rate, what we're probably talking about here is low intensity conflict. You can have a civil war that is also 
just a low intensity conflict. And so we are in a low intensity conflict right now. I don't think we, we are not yet in a civil war. And I want to make that very clear. You can have a low intensity conflict without achieving the, th without surpassing the threshold of a civil war, which I just described. Now, the term civil war is slightly less precise than saying something like a regional insurgency or a revolt or a popular revolution, which we all experienced in the summer of 2020, a war over an independence movement, straight up ethnic cleansing. Uh, so I, I'd like to be as precise and specific as possible when talking about conflict. So what are we actually looking at? There are three. There are, by the way, there are six. I have six six kind of models or six forms that a domestic conflict can take could take here in the United States. And I describe all six of those in my book. I'm going to hit the first three on the show today. By the way, if you want the, the details on the published date and other information on the forthcoming book, uh, you can head over to, um, I tell you what, go to, um, go to this website, www.grayzoneactivity.com slash dispatch. You can also just go to forwardobserver.com slash dispatch. And I, it's the same email list. And I, as soon as I have something solid to send people, I'll go ahead and send it to you. All right. So let's cover these first three kind of scenarios here. I'm interested in the concept of, and let me say interest. I'm interested in understanding, not pursuing uh, a concept of a state sponsored dirty war. And that is like Argentina's. Civil War, if you want to call it that, from 1976 to 1983. And someone asked me, I think, was it yesterday or maybe it was over on the high side yesterday? Someone asked me about what happens if Trump gets elected in 2024. And I said, I think we have a civil war in this country if he gets reelected in 2024. Well, one of the scenarios we could see is... Uh, like what happened in Argentina, where a right-wing government carried out state-sponsored eradication of socialist and communist groups and other left-wing radicals. We are here in the United States today. We have already been through kind of a, a building a sense of urgency for the domestic war on terrorism. The problem that I see is that at some point, we have gotten used to the pendulum swinging from the left to the right and then back to the left. And one of the interesting that's interesting things, this guy's a Yale political science professor. I don't recall what his name is, but he talks about this concept of political time. And he says that roughly every 30 to 40 years, there's kind of this metapolitical shift. Well, I don't want to say metapolitical. There's uh there's an ideological shift in this country that goes from left to right and then left and then back to right. And he, and he points out that during FDR, that was the start of roughly 30 to 40 years of more progressive politics in this country. And then you had the Reagan revolution, which started another 30 to 40 year political shift. And then you hit Obama, which he says is the next kind of 30 to 40 year political shift. So if his theory is accurate and you know he's written about it, I think it's interesting. I can't say for sure if it's accurate. Uh, if that is accurate, then we are the pendulum is shifting back towards the left. And people point to 2016 and uh, a lot of other things and say, well, that can't possibly be the case. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if we're actually in another 30 to 40 year swing to the left, but I could see how that happens. Which is why at some point, my biggest concern is that at some point that pendulum just stops swinging and someone on the left or someone on the right just uh, grabs the pendulum and says, that's far enough. You, you ain't going back. And, uh, and then we have like legitimate, well, legitimate's a bad word. We have um, authoritarianism in this country, like what you had kind of in, in Argentina. And so when we talk about the domestic war on terror, it just looks like to me they're, they're building up this apparatus and whatever party is in a position to take control whenever they want the pendulum to stop swinging, maybe, you know, maybe that side does, does stop it. 
one other thing. There's a really, really good book, and it's written by two lefty professors. I think they're both professors. Levitt and Zablansky, I want to say is his last name. What is this book called? Like the uh, How Democracies Die? Stand by. Let me Google this. Yeah, Ziblatt and Levitsky. There we go. Ziblatt and Levitsky, How Democracies Die. It's a really good book. I enjoyed reading it. I will probably reread it at some point in the future because it goes into a lot of history. One of the things that I noticed about this book, however, it is it is incredibly biased. Remember, it came out in 2017, maybe, somewhere around there during the Trump era, Trump administration. And their whole, it was when all those books about fascism started coming out. And the whole thing was Trump poses a threat to my to my democracy. And it warned about Trump fascism. And as I've explained, uh, Trump couldn't get even get his own defense secretary and uh, justice uh, attorney general to do what he wanted them to do. How could Trump have turned into a fascist? Uh, I just don't see a way that Trump could have actually employed fascism in this country because his own don't the people in his own administration couldn't do it or wouldn't go along with it. I thought the threat was overblown. Although I will admit <laughs> Trump had Trump had disdain for guardrails, which I actually agree with. I agree with that argument. He did have disdain for guardrails. However, it, um, probably not any more than uh, many other presidents. And it's just that, the establishment rallied around to protect the guardrails during the Trump administration, whereas they did a little bit less during like say the Bush and Obama administrations. At any rate, one of the things that I found in this book that was interesting is by the way, and they don't go into this and they don't even allude to this, but they just talk about all the times where right-wing governments seized the reins of government and took control and became authoritarians. And they go into like, I don't know, half a dozen, 10, maybe 12 different examples. It's a really, really good book. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it, like I said. And so I started doing some of my own research after reading that. And what I found was in a majority of those instances, the left and the right in those countries were in a foot race towards authoritarianism. It's not that the the right wing in those countries just said, hey, hey, let's take power. Let's just, what the heck? Let's just, go, let's just go do it, man. YOLO. All right. Um, what was happening is there was a left wing movement that was threatening to become more authoritarian. And the right wing movements in those countries just happened to beat them to the punch. And I really do think the same thing is happening here in the United States. I see both both parties becoming more authoritarian. And I, I honestly do believe it's just a matter of time before one party tries to seize, seize control of the government. And I think that's where we're headed. That's why I say I really do think that the United States is headed towards authoritarianism uh, within the next you know, 20 or so years, and maybe a lot sooner than that. But within the next 20 years, I, I firmly expect that. So getting back on track, the first model that our domestic conflict could take is kind of a, a state-sponsored dirty war, uh, a political purge, if you will, uh, like what we saw for, in Argentina from 76 to 83. All right, the second model that we could see is regional low intensity conflicts. Uh, worsening protests as political leaders urge mostly peaceful protests and nonviolent activism marked by sporadic political violence and terrorism against state governments and or the federal government, something along the lines of the Irish Troubles. Now, the Irish Troubles, I don't know, I've got a sizable portion of a chapter. Uh, where I take a look at the Irish Troubles and compare and contrast what's happening today, uh, kind of gauging if we are going to repeat the Irish Troubles, but but the American Troubles. Uh, during the Irish Troubles, there were 50,000 casualties and, and 3,500 dead over a roughly 30-year span. I said 20, it's really 30 years. And even, even then, by the way, Sinn Féin just got uh, reelected to uh, the majority. They're the, now the, the largest political party in Northern Ireland. And there's some speculation about whether they say, they talk about this five-year plan where they're going to try to reunite the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Of course, that means a, a referendum vote to break away from 
uh, from the United Kingdom. And by the way, the British have to, the British, not the Irish, the British have to call that referendum vote. So there's a big question about whether that's even going to happen. At any rate, uh, the Irish troubles could be looking something at the American troubles where you just have this low intensity conflict with that's marred by protests and terrorism and uh, lots of political violence. Uh, you look at a map. I shared the, by the way, over on the sub stack, which I really don't write on anymore. I shared a map of, of Northern Ireland during the, the troubles. And most of the political violence is consolidated into a handful of the larger cities and, and in some of the other counties. But uh, this is not a nation, you know, I mean, it's nationwide on the map, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there will be violence nationwide. One of the arguments that I make in the book and I've made in other places is that if you live in central Nebraska in an American trouble situation, or you live in uh, some highly rural red area, you're probably not going to see a lot of political violence in that area. Now, if you live in a purple area, especially in a big city, especially in a large blue city that controls the, the politics of an entire state that's mostly red counties, yeah, you're probably going to see political violence during the American Troubles. And I, uh, I make a few other points over there. Now, the third, the third conflict here is, or the third question, I guess, is will this escalate into organized political violence? And I want to make a distinction here between opportunistic or lone wolf violence, which has been armed. There have been leftists who have murdered people in this country. There have been left, they say rightists. I can't stand that term, but there have been right wing people or rightists who have killed, murdered people on the left. And so this is not a, this is not just a clean cut of like, oh, the right's doing all the killing. So, and listen, some of this stuff like, there have been a couple of these mass shooters who have been affiliated or expressed support for so-called anti-fascism and the anti-fascist, so-called anti-fascist movement in this country. And uh, there were links to anarchism or uh, other left-wing ideologies. At any rate, I make a big distinction between opportunistic violence and organized political violence. Organized political violence is you, uh, that would be like a militia. That would be a, um, a team that with some coordinated activity, one of the hallmarks of a, an insurgent group is it has to be, a, a formal organization and you have to have some kind of distinguishing, distinguishing characteristics, such as a name of your group or a patch or colors or uniform. And that's what I'm talking about. When I say p- organized political violence, I'm talking about teams of people planning and carrying out political violence. And people say, well, we there. what about mob violence in this country? Well, I don't think mob, viol- mob violence is not organized political violence. As a matter of fact, if you look at the anatomy of these mobs, it is highly disorganized. And they do that for a reason. There is no leadership in, there's no de facto leadership. It's not like cutting the head off a snake, right? You kill the head of Al-Qaeda and they have to replace someone. And generally in an insurgent group or a terrorist organization with a hierarchical chain of command, there's a clear-cut commander and people take commands from this individual. And if you kill him, then he will be replaced. Uh, in a lot of these disorganized mob events, there's no clear-cut leader. People are, they just go out and they do however they feel like protesting. That's what they'll do. So I make a big distinction between kind of disorganized violence and organized political violence. Now, there are a lot of other possibilities here. With that, I want to turn to the the doctrine here of low-intensity conflict, and that is the current model for this domestic conflict. And maybe this country, we don't rise to the, we don't pass a threshold of civil war, but we will be stuck with low-intensity conflict if we don't do that. Now, let's talk about exactly what is low-intensity conflict. And actually, Ben, go ahead and post your your questions here in the comments and I'll, I'll get to them. And Ben, if you can help me look over and find these comments, that would be fantastic. Or these questions rather. All right. Low intensity conflict. Number one is low intensity. 
low intensity conflict is the doctrine. It exists below the threshold of conventional war. So we're not talking about tanks and bombers, but it exists above routine peaceful competition. We are way above routine peaceful competition in this country. Political warfare is nothing new. They've been practicing political warfare since revolutionary times. And I'm not talking about merely political warfare. I'm talking about economic warfare, information warfare, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic warfare. Things you might call uh, gray zone warfare, low intensity conflict. Uh, I mean, te- in a lot of ways, they're, they're synonymous. I make the distinction between high intensity conflict, which is like World War II, which is conventional conflict, and unconventional or irregular conflict, like an insurgency. You know, compare and contrast World War II with the Iraq insurgency, right? Uh, big differences. And so when I say low intensity conflict, I'm really talking more about something that looks uh, closer to the Irish Troubles or the Iraq insurgency, and definitely not World War II. Uh, another characteristic of low intensity conflict, as we have seen throughout history, is a relatively small percentage of people who go out and actually uh, actively participate. Typically, it's less than 1%. In many cases, it's less than a half a percent who are actually involved in any fighting at any given time. And then you have another 5, 15, maybe 25% of the populace who is engaged in some level of support. Uh, Brigadier General, I forget what his first name is, but his last name was Griffith. He was a Marine Corps uh, Brigadier General. He studied communist insurgencies. And this was back in the 60s. And what he found was that once an insurgent group has 15 to 25% of the populace supporting them, they become very difficult to defeat. So if you have roughly two people out of every 10 in a city or a county or a region or a state supporting the insurgent movement, they become very difficult to defeat. Because when we talk about support, we're talking about lots of things. We're talking about information sharing and intelligence. We're talking about medical support, uh, healing people, healing insurgents who have been injured on the battlefield. We're talking about safe houses, We're talking about rat lines and logistics. You cannot drive a, military style vehicle through the streets of Baghdad without getting stopped. But you can dang sure be in a red opal little sedan with a bunch of materials in your trunk and maybe get through a checkpoint or well, maybe it depends on what they're doing at the checkpoint. Uh, but when we talk about civilian populace doing things like transportation and logistics, providing mobility, uh, that's just not something that, uh, a lot of insurgent organizations can do by themselves with just fighters. They require support. So when we talk about support personnel, what you might call the auxiliary and underground, that becomes a very important part of a conflict. And there are a lot of places in this country. This is the, this is the thing that's, that will be concerning. There are a lot of places in this country that probably has 15 to 25% of the population who would support active political violence in the next roughly two years. And it may not be the case today. However, what concerns me is that the general election, the presidential election, tends to animate the average American. And if if the election is highly contested, then yeah, we could see people moving to support political violence. Especially, especially when the other side is characterized as an existential threat. And both sides engage in this. Both sides say, the other side wants you dead. Now, at any rate, uh, this is, I don't think this is going to be needless to say. This is not going to be 1861 where you have 10% of the country in uniform fighting against each other. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. It's probably going to look a lot more like the Iraqi insurgency. Most people in low-intensity conflict, man, they just want to get on with their lives. They want to send their kids to school. They don't want their kids to be bombed or murdered. They don't want their – they want to be able to go to the grocery store and buy food, uh, put food on the family like uh, 
like W said, they want just want to be able to feed their families. And uh, that is an, an important, uh, important point here. We're really only talking about roughly 50% of the country involved in one way or the other, and only a fraction of 1% typically involved in the fighting. Uh, Pious Priest, can you put the name of the Brigadier General studying communist insurgency in show notes? Yes, I certainly will. By the way, if you want access to my show notes, I post them over on Patreon. If you want to support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash out front. And I'll, I'll make a note of that in today's thing. All right. So the first point I want to make about low intensity conflict is it is low intensity. Number two, we are currently in a hot piece in this country. I don't think anyone can say that this country is yet at war. And you certainly cannot say that we are at peace. If you ignore that this country has very deep fault lines, then I think you are ignoring reality. We can go back to everything we saw during the Trump era. We can go back to the political unrest and political instability we saw surrounding the 2020 elections. We can see what's happened, what's going on with the Supreme Court right now. And I still think January, November 24 to January 25, 25 could be a uh, could be the time when this whole thing pops off, which is my next point. Number three, it's very likely to worsen. Yes, Mike K. It is Samuel B. Griffith. Thank you. That's that's his name, Samuel B. Griffith. All right. This is not the first time in American history where we have had social movements that lead to a hot war or lead to political violence, I should say. So everyone knows about the American Revolution. Everyone knows about the War of Northern Aggression or the Civil War, the war between the states. However, uh, back in the back circa, what, 1920, the Palmer raids, where he had Attorney General Mitchell Palmer, he deported, I don't know, something like two, 3,000, maybe 5,000. I forget the exact number. He deported, let's just call it 3,000. He deported 3,000 Europeans back to Europe over their political uh, support for anarchism and socialism. As a matter of fact, the Palmer raids uh, kicked off because of mail bombs. These anarchists were putting mail bombs in the mail and they sent them to a bunch of politicians. Mitchell Palmer was one of those. Uh, I think it exploded on his front doorstep where his family lived. And that was pretty much the final straw. So this is not the, the first time in history where we've had acts of terrorism over politics. You go back and you read um, uh, Brian Burroughs book, Days of Rage. And all throughout the 60s, mid, mid to late 60s, even into the early 70s, Students for Democratic Society, Weathermen, et cetera, et cetera, all those groups, they really felt, the great thing is that he goes back and he interviews these people, and they really felt like they were on the cusp of, revo of a revolution. They really thought it was there. And So I guess all that is to say, this is not the first time we've had a revolutionary movement in this country. Um, I don't see how our problems go away. We have very deep fundamental differences in this country. We disagree that the number of things we disagree on, I think outweigh the number of things that we do agree on. I, I don't see how we will have a president who's able to unite the left and the right in this country. It used to be that maybe a government could go fight a war to bolster support at home. I, I don't see how that happens. Not today. So even if we do get into a war, by the way, I'm still very concerned that this whole Ukraine-Russia thing is going to blow up into NATO-Russia. I mean, it basically already is. We're basically already at proxy war with Russia. It's unfortunate the politicians who are so adamant about defending Ukraine don't go over there and defend it themselves. Uh, they they just want to send your children over there to fight their war. But I am very concerned that the, that American and NATO officials are misreading the situation in Ukraine. It's very concerning to me. If we, let's just say NATO were to get involved or the United States were to maybe declare war against Russia, 
that's not going to unite people at home. So I think that becomes an accelerator, if not a, a trigger. Let's just say that the economy can, can get fixed. Let's say we go through two to three years of a really terrible economy, go through stagflation. Uh, maybe even at some point in the next five to 10 years, maybe, maybe let's just say maybe there's hyperinflation. And all that stuff gets sorted out, and somehow the Ameri the somehow Congress gets our national debt under control. They get unfunded liabilities paid for. It's an impossibility, but let's just say, is that going to fix? Is that going to fill in the divide, the left right divide? Is that going to fill in the class divide here in this country? I don't think it will. So, I'll just be very frank. I don't see how this country gets over its political polarization. I guess that's a big intelligence gap for me. How did the 60s, how did the, the teens, the 30s, and the 60s get solved? Because those were the last times we had very strong uh, kind of uh, revolutionary movements, very strong uh, social movements that were disruptive and violent. By the way, violent social movements is low-intensity conflict. So the U.S. is no stranger to low-intensity conflict. My best guess, when we talk about conflict, we're talking about Three things, structural fault lines. Okay, those are the divides, left, right, race, class, religion, political ide ideology, sports teams, whatever. Then you have accelerators, and I happen to think that economic turbulence is an accelerator, not a trigger of conflict, but accelerators turn up the temperature on your stove. They turn up the temperature and brings the water to a soft boil. And then triggers are things that actually trigger the, the outbreak of violence. Uh, George Floyd was a trigger for that the beginning of that popular revolution. Now, I think a lot of people who were involved in that popular revolution didn't understand exactly the, the, the actual scenario. And I think a lot of those people, they probably were out in the streets because they wanted social justice or they wanted justice over George Floyd. They wanted... Uh, racial or economic justice or whatever. Um, the problem for them is that's not, uh, there were people using that anger to film in a popular revolution and they wanted to carry that. I I think they wanted to carry that through the election. And if Donald Trump had remained in office legally or illegally, if he had won the election, let's just say st state legislatures had acted or lawsuits have been filed much sooner and these mail-in ballots had been you know kicked out overturned the laws enforced on these ballots i mean i think that's that's really what tipped the election in my opinion not voting machines but all these mail-in ballots and the supreme state supreme court in some cases struck down the matching signature requirement and then allowed allow these ballots to be counted days following the election, days following the deadline. Let's just say that it all gotten cleared up and Trump remained in office. We absolutely, in 2021, we would have seen an attempted popular revolution. And I'm not talking about January 6th. I'm talking about a months-long, dedicated insurgency or proto-insurgency popular revolution, similar to 2014 Euromaidan similar to 2010, 2011 Arab Spring, to bring down the Trump government. Those plans have not gone away. They've just been put on the shelf somewhere. And my concern is that 24, 28, we could see something like that. And I think that's where we're headed. All right. Uh, ben, you have, let's see, Ben has a couple of questions. We'll, we'll wrap up with some questions here. I, but my overall point here is this is low intensity conflict. We can have a very disruptive period in this country without it escalating to guns in the streets. All right. Do you think Chaz and Chaz and other cities will be more common? That's a good question. These autonomous zones. So there were several of them erected. And they try to do one in Nashville. And I think they try to do one in D.C. too. 
that is uh, like revolutionary anarchist stuff. One of the takeaways for me is that revolutionary anarchists have a strong presence in Portland and Seattle, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago. Not really a, an incredibly strong presence outside of that. So as, as far as these autonomous zones, I'm sure they will push for these autonomous zones because it just kind of ideologically they are... I think ideologically that's a strategic victory, honestly, establishing an autonomous zone. Even for a period of time, it's because it strikes at the legitimacy of the government. It effectively says in this zone, the government is no longer, the government no longer has legitimacy. And if a government doesn't have the capacity to, uh, to take away the autonomous zone or to clear the auto autonomous zone, then that area has just struck at two of the three main pillars of government. All right, Mike, can you comment on how you might con convince loved ones to leave these places where the Irish troubles may occur? Well, I don't know. I mean, listen, people have jobs and livelihoods. Life, here's the thing about low-intensity conflict, right? I mean, this we're not talking about Mariupol here, where a whole city crumbles. We're talking about, you know, people still went to work during the Irish Troubles. I mean, in terms of, you know, convincing them to leave where these Irish Troubles may occur, I don't know. It's hard to say because in a lot of these cities, uh, for a lot of people, life kind of went on as usual. And there were just some people doing some things in the background. Uh, how, so I, I don't know. I guess I it's I just don't look at it as my job to try to convince family members to leave. I think uh That's a good question. I'm I'm just I'm probably not in a good place to answer it. Uh, how likely is it that the military will intercede as beat cops in dense cities? Yes, we could have the deployment of military to city streets again and uh one of the things that I think kind of a baseline scenario for lots of places in the United States. Like if you travel throughout Latin America, it's, it's pretty common to see private security, like rent a cops, city law enforcement, and some form of national guard or military in the same area, providing security. Like that's happened in Colombia. That happens in Mexico. There are still checkpoints when I was in Argentina. So uh, I think that is going to become a lot more common here in the United States over the next 20 years. So how likely is it that the military will intercede as beat cops or at least maybe fulfill in some and perform some kind of security duties, i.e. the National Guard? I think there's a very good chance that happens. Um, maybe nearing 100% for in a 2024-25. As a former nuke guy... I wonder what might happen to American nuclear arsenal in this upcoming conflict. What might happen to rockets and bombs if the country splits apart? That's a great question. I don't even know that. Here's when I would be more concerned. When states start talking about having their own currency or uh, if, they're, if they do move away from the dollar. By the way, I saw someone talk about the comments that the dollar is probably the last thing holding this country together. Uh, the strength of the dollar, relative strength of the dollar. I, I think that's true. I've said that, that the U.S. economy and the dollar is probably the last uh, the last real kind of institutional force that's keeping the country together. And will the... So when I start seeing states talking about accepting silver and gold as a form of payment, or some states start pushing a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency to be recognized as some formal payment. And when I see states start talking, seriously talking, and to my knowledge, this has not happened, but again, I don't pay close attention to a lot of states. But when I start seeing people write into their local newspaper, or this comes up on websites or talk shows or whatever, about how states are going to secure 
nuclear weapons or secure some kind of federal equipment that currently is in their state, i.e. a an army base, that I think that's when you say, yeah, th- this whole balkanization thing could, could seriously happen. Until then, it's really just a lot of speculation. I don't know how they're going to do that, but it's a good question. If the food shortages slash prices become worse over the summer, as predicted, and gas continues to skyrocket, do you think we'll see an uptick in violence from Antifa and other divisive groups? Was it in 2020, Andrew Yang? I don't agree with Andrew Yang's politics. He seems like a pretty, pretty okay guy to me. But he warned, and he got a lot of backlash for this, but he warned in 2020 that race riots could become food riots. And I think what's probably most likely to happen, just like we saw during the Arab Spring and we're seeing in places all around the world right now, is food riots or protests that the government's not doing more to provide more food. Now, as a lot of people have said, and I think they're right, that's going to become more pronounced, especially in third world countries that are not food secure that import a lot of their food. I think that's going to be uh, probably not as bad in the United States, but yeah, we could definitely see food protests and riots here in this country. As far as, I mean, if Antifa gets involved, I don't know, man. I think the revolutionary wing of, of the left will be out. They might try to foment some civil unrest. Uh, but I, I don't think it'll be like 2020. I don't think it'll be a popular revolution, but it could be. Uh, do you think there will be violence in 2024 centered around mail in ballot boxes? I have not seen this new movie that came out, 2000 Mules. However, I plan to watch it. Could there be vigilantes going out and standing guard over these ballot boxes? And could that become a thing for 15 minutes in the media? Or could that become a lot worse and be a weeks or months long battle for some of these in some of these cities? And I mean, political, political and social battle, legal battle, not kinetic battle here. Yeah, for sure. I could definitely see that happening. I could see a lot of militia spinning up to go provide security and make sure that uh, make sure that the government's doing their job. Will there be violence? It seems to me that, I mean, just a logical conclusion is that if if one side shows up to guard ballot boxes, then the other side will as well. So, yeah, there's probably a good chance of that. How many people is needed in a preparedness group to be effective, or what is a good number to shoot for? Well, it kind of depends on your needs, and it depends on what you're preparing for. For instance, if we're preparing for to evacuate a hurricane, Uh, my operational requirements are not the same as if I'm preparing for, I don't know, let's just say a grid down, a nuclear exchange with Russia, Uh, something like that. It really depends on what your requirements are. So in terms of personnel, I think you do hit a, I think you do hit a ceiling where uh, people become redundant and therefore they become, I don't want to say redundant, where people become more of a liability than an asset. And uh, I don't know. I Listen, I would say for the average scenario, you need like five or 10 dudes who live in your local area who can, you know, be at your house or be at someone's house in, you know, say 30 minutes, 15 minutes. And if you have five or 10 dudes who can do that, you are, I mean, you're, you're sitting pretty, I think. In terms of something more protracted, then yeah, I think uh, you need you need medical, you need comms, you need intel, you need supply and logistics, you need you know a motor pool for lack of a better term, you know mechanic. Uh, there's a bunch of guys like Viking preparedness and Bear Independent. They talk about this kind of stuff on their channels, and I would kind of defer to them in terms of what's optimal. It's not really my wheelhouse. All right, so is it a good time to start a private security company? Yeah, I was on a podcast several months ago. And I think I've even said this in several places, um, maybe on this channel, or maybe, I don't know, somewhere. That, yeah, my expectation is that parts of the United States 
more closely resemble the security situation throughout much of Latin America, where you have private security who fulfill the role of local police or local military. I don't know if it's a good time to start a private security company. But I do know, where I do expect that private security will become much more, much more common. Do you believe drought water and water shortages will set off conflicts in the U.S. anytime soon? Yeah, you know, we keep we're, we keep being told that there are going to be water wars over these shortages. And will it set off conflicts in the United States anytime soon? I don't know. I haven't considered it. But it certainly could be an accelerator. Um, especially one of the things, let me remember this, because I reported on this, I don't know, in the past year or so. Some farmers out west were very angry with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation because they cut off irrigation water to these farms. Could there be some kind of low-intensity conflict over water usage in the west where there is an ongoing, ongoing drought? Part of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which has, throughout history, if I recall correctly, lasted for roughly 20 to 30 years a time at a time when the PDO does occur. Yeah. Yep, I do. Uh, when will we see you with Tim Pool? I don't know. That's a good question. But I would love to talk with Tim Pool about low intensity conflict, insurgency, popular revolution, and go into a lot more detail. To I imagine we'll have a conversation about it, uh, and uh, go into a lot more detail about uh, about all this stuff. What could happen? What I see happening? It'd, it'd be a great conversation. All right, gang. We are way over time today. And so with that, I'll be back tomorrow at 2 p.m. If you want to support the show, patreon.com slash outfront. If you want to support our work over at Forward Observer and also get all of our reporting on far left and far right groups, which we are in the process of ramping up, then you can do that over at forwardobserver.com slash subscribe. Uh, by the way, you can all you can get all our stuff on China and Russia as well. And Latin America. We're doing a weekly LATAM view now. Which, by the way, Max just finished that, and we'll be sending that out today. So with that, everyone, thanks for the support. I'll be back tomorrow, 2 p.m. Central Time. Until then, be well and stay out front.